us now talk about renewable energy resources. As different from the non-renewable energy resources, renewable energy resources are ones where the, the basic source of the energy continually gets renewed. That is, that there is an everlasting supply of that energy. It's not like a fuel that would ever run out. And we're going to talk about uh, the renewable energy resources, uh, their advantages and their disadvantages um, in this video. So basically, the ones I want to talk about today include solar heating, solar panels, wind, tide, slash waves, uh, geothermal, biomass, wood, and I think we're nearly there. Is there any? Like this? Ah, hydroelectric. And we're going to talk about each one in time. If we want to survive on planet Earth for more than the mere few thousand years that we have been here, then what we need to do is learn from those things around us that have been here for much longer. The trees have been on Earth for millions of years, in perfect balance with Earth's systems, and yet they, ambitious as they are, grow to ginormous heights. So how do they do it? What renewable energy source do they use? Well, in fact, they use the energy delivered to the Earth's surface from the sun in the form of sunlight. They take that energy that has been transferred to their leaves and through the process of photosynthesis, convert it into chemical energy stored in the glucose and plant fibers themselves. If we want a future here on Earth, we must take a leaf from their book. <laughs> the bad news is we can't extract energy ourselves in the same way because we are not plants. We have not got chloroplasts in our extremities to absorb that sunlight and turn it into chemical energy. But there are ways in which we can take energy out of the sunlight. You see, sunlight, as demonstrated by this very large torch, is the sort of thing that to our eyes looks completely white. It is a mixture of colours. And in here there is an equal amount of all of the primary colours of light. And so it appears white to our eyes. But a long time ago, a scientist called William Herschel was studying the spectrum of white light and he found that there was something that our eyes couldn't see that was being delivered with the light. It was called infrared radiation. Now you need to understand that infrared radiation is just a colour of light that our eyes cannot see. And yet what we can do is we can feel it we're actually sensitive on our skin to infrared radiation. Now, I have here a infrared lamp. Now, this infrared lamp is giving off some red light, and that's how you can see that it is on. Uh, but also, it's giving off something else, something that my hands can instantly feel when I place it in front of this light. It is, in common words, heat. I can feel heat transferring to my hand. This is what is coming with the sunlight. It gives you that glorious feeling of sunlight on your body when you step from the shade into the sun and you feel that instant heat all over you. Well, you perhaps don't experience that around here, but if you're in a hot country, you certainly would know, even if you couldn't see, that you'd stepped into the sunshine. Now what we can do is we can take the energy from this infrared radiation and use it to heat certain things. I have 
filled some water just here from the fountain. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow this infrared radiation from this torch to warm the water up. And I'm going to do it just by placing the infrared torch just here and allowing it to start heating the water. Here we have a thermal imaging camera. And you can see that at the moment the water is still quite cold and the surrounding carpet is warming up much faster. And this is to do with the specific heat capacity of the two. But over time, that water there will start to increase in temperature until it has warmed. And then we can extract the thermal energy from that water and transfer it into electrical energy to be delivered through the national grid. So how does it work? on an industrial scale. Well, in places like Seville in Spain, they have a very large tower. In the top of the tower, they have a water tank up here. And around the base of the tower, they have a series of mirrors. And these mirrors track with the sun so that the angle between the sunlight and the tower is always just perfectly aligned. So the sunlight from the sun comes down and hits each of these mirrors in such a way that the light is then reflected onto the solar tower in the same place. This enables a large area of light and a large amount of infrared radiation to be focused on the water, making the water very hot indeed. And what they then do with the water is with a small pipe they take it and they take it to the point where it is boiling and they take from it the steam that is coming off the process and it in its narrow little pipe turns a turbine which then is attached to a generator and transports electricity to the surrounding places. Now the advantages of this are clear, that you get energy every time the sun shines, and that this can be done forever. The disadvantages, or perhaps I should say the limitations, come from the fact that the sun doesn't always shine. Here, the sun very rarely shines, but in other places such as Spain or North Africa, you have almost constant sunshine, and therefore those places are particularly rich in resources when you consider this renewable energy resource. About a hundred years ago, scientists noticed something quite exceptional. That certain polished metal surfaces gave off electrons when light shone upon them. What they noticed was that electrons jumped out of the surface of the metal when the light hit the surface. And what they noticed was if they placed another piece of metal nearby, then the light would have the effect of making the electron jump from one piece of metal to the next. And that the sunlight was acting like a little pump, pumping the electrons from one place to another. Now in a chemical battery, it's a chemical reaction that is driving the pump. Here, it is the energy in the sunlight. And so scientists, encapsulating these pieces of metal in glass, created the photovoltaic cell. Two pieces of metal that electrons would jump between when sunlight hit it. Then, placing multiple photovoltaic cells next to each other, forming a photovoltaic battery, or a solar panel, they were able then to extract electrical energy direct from the sunlight itself. Of course, there are huge advantages on this technology. This technology can be produced in large quantities. It can cover fields and fields and is produced quite cheaply. The glass is made out of sand. One of the other things that it's very useful for is that it can be placed on the roof of houses. Now it has to be a south-facing roof, 
for enough of the sun's actual light to strike it. Uh, but ultimately, this is something that you could have associated with your house, contributing to the energy that your house uses. Now, the energy that it provides is a direct current, a continuous flow of energy. And this is useful for our electronics, and it is useful for our houses. But there is a big problem with it if we then try to sell it back to the national grid. The national grid is an alternating current. The electrons flow backwards and forwards 50 times a second, producing a current that actually meanders up and down like the surface of the ocean. This produces a current that is flat calm, always travelling in one direction. And for making the electricity that this produces compatible with the national grid, we have to delete half of it to produce that curve. Now, digitally deleting half of the energy that your solar panels have produced means that that energy isn't worth very much. In fact, it is basically half the value of any other energy source. So though this is good for powering your house, it is not very good for transporting across long distances or selling back to the national grid. It's also limited by the weather. If the sun doesn't shine, then there's no energy uh, being captured on the roof of your house. You know, it's not always sunny here. In fact, it's, it's, it's very rarely sunny here. But what we do have is other weather, nice weather, like rain and wind. And that weather also is a source of energy if we know how to use it properly. The wind ultimately has energy stored in it from sunlight. You see, the sunlight falls down onto the Earth's oceans and it warms up the surface to the extent where evaporation occurs. We get a warm air and it changes the density of the air by having all of those particles of water uh, in the atmosphere. And of course, with the density change, it means that if there is more air in one place than in another, it's going to try to move to readdress the balance. And this causes the wind. So ultimately, it was sunlight that started it. But what we know here is that we experience it as a sudden and rapid movement of air, and it blows on our shores nearly all the time. And here I have a turbine, just like the turbines that sit in the steam passage of the coal power station, with exactly the same behind it a generator ready to turn the kinetic energy of the turbine into electrical energy to be carried away. You can see here what basically happens is the wind <laughs> causes that turbine to turn. Now of course I could make this more efficient by making this turbine bigger so that the generator could carry a larger amount of coils when it turns, generating more electricity carrying more energy away from this. The bigger, the better. More turbines as well is another way of amplifying the effect. We can put turbines in any windy place and most of the time they will turn and produce some uh, electrical energy for us. If there isn't enough land we can put them in the sea and you may see from places around the coast of the United Kingdom that there are offshore wind farms catching that wind, and the wind will blow forever, and it's free. There are some limitations of this technology, however. The turbines are quite big, and they're quite expensive to make and install. People think they don't look very nice. People also are concerned that placing them in wild, remote, and quite often beautiful places spoils those places. Another major disadvantage is you have to have an awful lot of them, and they have to be awfully big before they generate even the amount of electricity that a small nuclear power station would produce. However, the energy is free, and it is unlimited. Over 75% of the Earth's surface is covered with water. 
of the oceans. And the movement of the oceans is a place from which we can extract some energy. I am referring to tidal and wave energy. Now what they have in common is the fact that they are both movements of water, but the cause of each is different. With tides, the dominant cause of the tides is the movement of the moon around the earth. Every 27 days, the moon makes one complete orbit of the earth, but the earth, of course, is turning uh, much faster. Every 24 hours, it rotates on its axis, so from Earth's point of view, it looks like the moon has passed overhead every single day, again and again and again. Now, when the moon is overhead, or alternatively, when the moon is directly beneath your feet, there is a net movement of the Earth's water, and this causes the sea level where you are to rise and fall over a 12-hour period. Now, imagine that by the sea, you had a large container of air. Now, and that air was open to the sea at the bottom, but sealed everywhere else. At the top, there was a small opening and a little turbine. Now, as the sea level rise, it would flood the container from the bottom and press the air out the top in much the same way as I have with this um, bicycle pump. As the sea level rises, it pushes the air out the top. When the sea level falls, it pulls air back in again. Every 12 hours, there is this net movement of air. That is one way that we can extract the movement of the ocean and turn it into the turning of a turbine and the production of electricity at a generator. There are other ways in which we can extract uh, the energy from the tides by placing giant underwater turbines in the narrow openings of certain estuaries, when there is that net movement, the funneling of a large amount of water, like what happens in the Bristol Channel, then what would happen is those turbines would start to turn, and they would then generate electricity. Now, of course, the limitations of this are the fact that you only get one rise every 12 hours, and that you need a very large structure to generate what ultimately would be a very small amount of electricity. But what about the waves? What causes the waves? Well, it's not the moon. It is, in fact, the sun. You see, as we said with wind power, the warming up of the Earth's oceans causes a change in density of the atmosphere, which causes this pressure which pushes the air away from those high pressure regions to areas of the atmosphere that are lower pressure. Now, where that air rushes across the surface of the ocean, it causes energy to be transferred into the water molecules, causing them to move and oscillate from side to side. If you have a large stretch of water and the wind has been blowing fiercely on it, then you're going to have waves transferring energy without matter. And you can extract the uh, energy from these in much the same way as you would from the tide. You know, using that same trapped vessel of air, as the wave passes underneath, it could pull air through, and as the wave travels back up again, it could push air back out again. And this continual motion would mean that you could then extract the energy from the waves. There's always going to be waves, and this technology uh, is going to uh, be able to produce some energy very, very, very uh, uh, cheaply, uh, but of course you haven't got a large setup cost of building it in the first place. Mm. Now here I have a air pump, and I'm going to just have a little go. I'm going to just put my thumb over the end of this air pump, and I'll hook it up. And I want to show you what happens to the air pump when I put it under pressure. Well, this is what happens. The air pump looks quite normal, doesn't it? But actually you can see that down at the bottom of the air pump, it has become really warm. You see that? The whole pipe at the bottom of the air pump has become warm because of the pressure that it was put under. Now deep inside the earth, there is all of the pressure acting of the weight of all of the rock and ocean above it 
pressing down on those rocks at the centre. And just like with the air pump, that makes those rocks really hot. And we're familiar with this, of course, because we've seen pictures of volcanoes, lava erupting all over the place, liquid rock, very hot temperatures. Now, in certain places, the hot rocks are close to the surface. Let me, let me show you a little bit closer. You see here, we have this region that runs right down the middle of the Earth, called the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. It's where the tectonic plates of the Earth are separating. But right up here, we have this lovely little place called Iceland. And Iceland is so close to that ridge that the hot rocks are just beneath the surface. In places like Iceland and similar places, we can pump warm water out from deep underground and then extract the heat from it before pumping back cold water again to the bottom. This is called geothermal. It's a very steady source of energy. The earth is very warm, but it, like tidal, is not actually energy that has come from the sun. Tidal energy, of course, comes from the movement of the moon, and with geothermal, it comes from the pressure of the Earth's weight bearing down on its interior. We can only use geothermal in countries that are close to warm rocks. So in places like Iceland and Greenland and places like um, New Zealand, all of these places close to geothermal regions can be used to extract energy from the Earth itself. Look at this, folks. Biomass. This is free. It's just fallen off this tree. What we can do with this is we can make a giant compost heap. And from the breakdown of all of the energy, the chemical energy that was stored in this tree when it was growing, we can turn that into thermal energy. And we can extract the, uh, the energy from that and turn it into electrical energy. All we need is a large amount of this plant material. Look at all of these trees. They have been absorbing the energy from the sun and storing it as chemical energy for years and years. You know what we could do? We could burn the lot of them. You see, all of these are a ready store of chemical energy that through combustion could be unlocked to heat up water, turn a turbine and generate electricity. Cruel, you say? Well, actually, think about it like this. If you grow the trees for that purpose, then you create a space for wildlife, a place, a forest that can exist but with purpose. At the end of the growth period of the trees, you can cut them down. And if you think that this might be polluting for our atmosphere, then think about this. The burning of natural fuels, such as wood, only puts into the atmosphere the same carbon dioxide as those trees absorbed whilst they were alive. It's carbon neutral to burn wood. We're not taking carbon from some ancient ecosystem and releasing it into our air. Oh no. We're taking the uh, carbon from the air and we're releasing it back into the air. Neutral. Of course, it takes an awful long time for trees like this to grow. We might consider faster growing timbers, bamboo, or some such thing. Across the world, we have to be careful about this. Growing plants uh, of, a, of, a single, of a single species in large quantities is really bad for biodiversity. Digging up the rainforest and replacing it with palm oil trees, for example, was a really terrible idea. And yet we did it because there was money in it. We have to be careful. At this point in time, there is not enough trees on Earth to meet our energy demands. So we have to consider this as an option alongside other energy resources. What about rain? Can we extract any of the energy from the rain? And indeed we can. But you've got to imagine that this has ultimately come from the sun as well. It was the sun that did the work in evaporating the oceans in the first place to create the rain clouds. And then that rain cloud moved across the country and fell as rain. In some places, it landed in mountain reservoirs, high up above the surface of the water. As a consequence, there is gravitational potential energy stored in the rain itself. 
And so, just here we have a large reservoir of water. And what we're going to do is we're going to release it. Now this is done in places around the country where there are mountains and places where the water can be stored in the first instance. The flow of the water as it goes from the higher place to the lower place is something that we can use to turn a turbine and generate electricity when we choose. So for example, if I will turn on the water turbine, catching the water flow, it's a little bit chaotic, but what we should have is the turning of the turbine, there we go, generating hydroelectric power. to this. Solar heating uses a turbine. When the water is heated it boils, uh, produces steam which drives a turbine. Solar panels do not. They produce a steady flow of direct current. Wind turns a turbine. The tide and waves turn a turbine. Geothermal turns a turbine. Biomass ultimately turns a turbine. Burning of wood, producing heat. If we want to extract uh, energy from it to turn into electricity, it would have to turn a turbine. And hydroelectric also turns a turbine. So the odd one out is the photovoltaic cells, the solar panels. They're the only way that we can extract energy from the environment on an industrial scale that doesn't involve turbines. Now, given that, Mains electricity, to be sent at long distances, requires it to be an alternating current that is going forwards and backwards. And we'll learn more about this in a later topic. Which of these produce alternating current? Well, to start with, a solar panel will produce direct current, but all of the rest have the potential for creating alternating current, the current that could be transported long distances. So therefore, given what I said before about the limitation of solar panels, meaning that half of the energy would have to be thrown away to make it an alternating current to transport over long distances, then surely these other types are better. Well, not really, because a wind turbine, for example, does not turn at the same frequency as the mains electricity. In fact, mains electricity goes through a complete cycle every 0.02 seconds. If wind turbines turned that fast, you wouldn't be able to see them. They turn much, much slower. With gearing, we can produce frequencies that are similar to the 50 hertz mains electricity. But every time we add a gear, we lose some of the efficiency of the process. And so this makes the energy even smaller that we can then turn and usefully use. Now, with all of these energy resources, you may think that uh, they are clearly the way forward, but one thing they all have as a limitation is scale. All of these are very difficult uh, to do at a very large scale. There's no centralised, one big factory somewhere approach to these. We have to spread it out to extract the energy from the environment. Now, a single nuclear power station, for example, could produce a huge amount of energy similar to this. A hundred seconds to midnight. That is the time on our doomsday clock. This old clock doesn't run anymore, so we decided to set its hands at a fixed time. A time that is in line with the international doomsday clock. But what is this thing that I speak of? 
Well, the doomsday clock is an indicator of just how close mankind is to total and utter destruction. There are things that threaten our very existence, things such as war, nuclear weapons, climate change, poverty. All of these things contribute to the insecurity of our species. We are here today, but will we be here tomorrow? One of the things that is a real concern for people across the world is the rising population of the planet. And with increasing numbers of people, an increasing number of people living technological lives, there is this ever rising demand for energy. Now, up until this point, we have used non-renewable energy sources to generate that energy and meet that demand. But this cannot go on, for the scarcity of those resources and the increasing demand mean that the two cannot be met. In the future, we may be able to tap into the energy sources of the sun itself with a process known as nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion, a technology that we have not yet been able to make on an industrial scale, would use a fuel of hydrogen present in everyday water and turn it into helium, which would float out of our atmosphere, a noble gas that does not interact, is not a greenhouse gas, and is quite fun in party balloons. And from the collision of hydrogen atoms, you would get helium produced and a huge amount of energy, just like what happens inside the sun. The only problem with this is that it has to take place under very high temperatures and pressures, like in the interior of the sun, and we just cannot yet make those sorts of conditions. And so for a while, that's it. The future, there is an unlimited energy uh, uh, answer, but for now, we have this gap. We are living in the interval. Up to now, non-renewables. In the future, nuclear fusion. But right now, we have to make a choice. And that choice is renewable. Until we can get nuclear fusion online, we have no choice. If we do not stop burning non-renewable fossil fuels, we will cause an irreversible change in our atmosphere that would push us not closer to midnight, but to midnight itself. And so until the scientists, until the physicists, and until the governments that support those scientists and physicists uh, invest heavily in nuclear fusion, then we're going to have to select the renewable energy sources to fill in the gap. Not any one of them will be enough. At this point, because of our growing demand, we need to employ all of the methods discussed in this video. Otherwise, it's game over.